All right. So we are, by the way, thank you all for a really incredible weekend. And uh, it was beautiful. And I feel very appreciated. And I'm really excited for everything that's uh, happening. And uh, uh, Marvin, mazel tov to you and winning our uh, Family of the Year Award with Sharon and sharing that with the Davises. And Ron, mazel tov to you for winning our Individual of the Year, Volunteer of the Year. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, call on user two. Uh-oh. What happened to call on user one? Uh, but I guess mom and dad have made it safe. Thanks for joining us. And uh, uh, let's do it. Let's do some studying. So as I said, we're going to... Oh, Ron, actually, you got a new picture. I like that. Uh, that that's the influencer picture. There you go. Well, you're influencing us with your photo. Okay, thank you. I just okay. want to let you know I won't be here next week or the week before I'm going to see my daughter. I'm going so to miss you. I want to you know, listen. Zoom, you could still Zoom in. Not that, you know, not that I'm suggesting that, but yeah, enjoy but her. It's two hours earlier there. Two hours earlier. Well, I'll, if I'll tell you a secret, then we'll actually, I mean, we did come to learn and not to schmooze, but yeah, in two <laughs> weeks, I'm going to be three hours earlier. Yeah, oh. I'm, I'm thankfully flying to LA in two weeks to uh, be at the ordination of Rabbi Jacobs and Rabbi Rosenbaum. So oh, I, I will be Zooming very early, but- uh, is, is, that, is, that the weekend is that the weekend they're having their party? Uh, no, they're, they're, um, they're getting ordained May 22nd, yeah. 22nd? Yeah. I'm gonna be in LA from the 16th to the 21st. Oh, oh. No, nobody told me I needed to be there for an ordination. I know. Almost, <laughs> almost. Okay. So, uh, Booker Tovin, good morning. We are going to make our way. We're still in these weeks between Pesach and Shavuot. We're studying Pirkei Avot. We're using this version, which I still don't think is online anywhere. So that's why I was finding the scans. So we're going to use our scan version. It's Rabbi Gordon Tucker and Rabbi Tamar Elad Applebaum's uh, commentary which is really beautiful in my opinion. And uh, we're gonna make our way and we are now uh, jumping off and we're gonna look at the end of chapter one. Um, so I'm gonna pull it up and who's gonna be our reader? We'll start with Marvin first, if that's okay. Okay. All right, we'll do a screen share. Pretty sure it's this, boom. Oh. Okay, let me just, it's pretty big. Let me make it a touch smaller. Okay. All right, Ruth, you wanna be our Hebrew reader first and then we'll pass it over to Marvin? Yes, I will. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel Omer al shlosha dvarim haolam kayam al hadin ve al haemet ve al hashalom שנאמר אמת ומשפט שלום שיבטו בשעריכם. Thank you. All right, Marvin, can you read the translation? Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel liked to say, the world is sustained by three things, by justice, by truth, and by peace. As it is said, you shall administer truth and just judgment and peace in your gates. Right, and that's a quote from Zachariah, Zachariah. Okay, so I want to pause for a second. Does this sound, sound vaguely familiar or what does it sound like? Should we start singing? Yeah, right? Yeah, I was going to say, I remember, I remember the song from USY days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. not just from USY days, right? Asher l'shad devarim ha'olam omeh. Not just from them, but we actually studied it three weeks ago because yeah. wow. that's in the beginning of the first chapter of Perkei yeah. On three yeah. things does the world stand, right? Mm -hmm. On yeah. Torah, on worship, and on acts of kindness. And if you remember when we studied it, um, Rabbi Tamar has an interesting take on worship, which is Avodah, which was work. And there she talked about the Chalutzim, the pioneers who worked the land of Eretz Israel, of Israel. So we study this already. So the Mishnah of Perkei Avot, the chapter begins with this idea that the world is upheld by three things. Those were, what's the difference between 
there where it's Torah, prayer, or whatever you want to understand as worship, and, and acts of kindness, or mitzvot, how is that different than this? They are, they're different, but uh, they, they try to reach what this one says. Hmm, they they, say a little more. They, al uh, HaTorah, al HaVodah, if you follow what was said earlier, the idea is to attain what this says, justice, truth, and you will attain peace by following that. Beautiful. Maybe, you know, again, just sort of taking from what you said, those were, those are tools for implementation. Those are like driving for, those are, those are the applications that we have to do in order to reach these? Yes. Okay, nice. Other, other comments, thoughts before we actually go into the commentary? These are goals. Goals, okay. That, that can be achieved. Okay, are these particularly Jewish? Yeah, the other ones were Torah, av Avoda, which Oda. is either the sacrificial system or, or tefillah, prayer. Um, are those, the, one is Jewish. Is this still Jewish or is this more universal? Yeah, this would be applicable uh, to the world. Um, can you? Sorry, I got to hold it. Someone called me four times in a row. I got to just pick this up. I'm sorry. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> if it lets me. Okay, you did not talk amongst yourselves, but that's okay. Okay. <laughs> you were not good students. You didn't follow we, what I just said. We were talking quietly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, other comments or thoughts, right? It's a beautiful verse, right? Yeah. You may have heard the verse before, Emet Umishpat Shalom Shiftuk Basharechem, right? That you shall administer truth, justice, and peace in your gates. It's a beautiful verse, right? So, yeah. Anything else about this, and then we'll actually get into it. Um, um, there is a. It, it actually. Yeah, go ahead. I know you like superheroes. It sounds like truth, justice in the American way. It does sort of sound like, yeah, the Superman and our Cleveland guys, you know, and their mission, 100%. Um, yeah, 100%. The other thing just to point out is, right, this is Al Shlosha Devarim Ha'ulam Kayam, as opposed to. Right. So what's the difference between Kayam and Omed? Is it is it the same thing? Is it different? What do, what do those words mean? Kayam is existing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I hear that it says sustained. Okay, existing, upheld. I don't know. Or is upheld the other one? Yeah. Uh, and what's Omed? Standing. Yeah. Standing. So, like, is there a different? You know, is there a difference um, between standing and existing? Yes, one can exist without standing. Yeah. So, think about right. Yeah, right here. I'm looking the the translation from the previous one is the world stands on three things, as opposed to the world is sustained by three things. Right. That's very different. Um, yeah, so like what's different about that? And um, standing, what's what's a more active word? Maybe standing, and those were active things that you had to do? Or Exist. this is more sort of? Rise. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're ready to read some of the commentary on it? Okay, Marvin, you're up. We're gonna drop down to Rabbi Tucker from a formal point of view. Uh, Gordon Tucker, from a formal point of view, this first chapter of a vote is given a symmetric frame. The named sages at the beginning and the end are both Shimon, and both of them mm. enumerate for us 
the three pillars on which their age, the temporal meaning of olam, in this context must stand. See commentary on 1012 above. All right, just Although to pause it, for a second. What he's saying here is, right, their age meaning that moment in time. Right. But he's not saying this is some eternal idea that these are the three things we have to, which we always say, right? He's saying at that moment in time, his era, that's what they needed. Okay, go ahead. Although it is extremely common in the Talmud and the Midrashic literature to have verses from the Tanakh quoted in support of a teaching, it is much rarer in the Mishnah. This is the first occurrence of this kind in a vote. Why it is here must remain a matter of speculation. One possibility is that it justifies the change in the triad already received from Shimon and the righteous uh, above, and her and her possibility in the end of the another. Three. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, another possibility <laughs> is that it reminds the listener or reader that even as Temple Judaism has come to an end. There is an underlying continuity with a biblical era that rabbinic Judaism was determined to assert. Right. So, I mean, not that exciting, but he's saying like, we actually, we didn't look at every single mission in the first chapter. This is the last one of the first chapter, but we've never had a quote from Tanakh, from the Bible to support a position, right? If you remember, they just gave their things, right? Build a fence around the Torah, uh, right? Judge a person favorably, right? Like the... The rabbis just sort of gave their take on things or like what you should do. They gave their their ethical values or the way to live and they never gave us source. So he's like, Rabbi Tucker is just sort of like thinking like or, or asking like why specifically here do we have a verse? And it's just because it's nice. Is it because we are closing? This is the last one of a chapter and it's a beautiful way to end a chapter. Um, or is this idea that this connects rabbinic Judaism, which is the Mishnah and this teaching with the Bible and saying that we are affirming that. Other comments or thoughts from what Marvin read? All right, well, yeah, I, I think I think you're making too much of a point about that this is the first time in per cal vote because it's all over the Mishnah where there's quotes. Is that true? Well, oh, maybe you know what? I'm I'm getting confused. Yeah, the mission is pretty succinct and doesn't no, often, no, I'm, and does I'm, not usually give a source. You know what? I'm thinking about Sefer Hachinuk. It's all over the place. Yeah, the Mishnah oftentimes just gives the the teaching. Sometimes it'll give the the verse, but usually not. Then usually that's what the Talmud does, right? The Gemara asks, right? Where's the source? Where do we learn this from? And that's the role of the Gemara then to, to find the source. Um, and that's where they always debate like, oh no, that verse teaches a different thing, right? So yeah, the mission is very concise. Okay, so uh, Marvin, if you'll take us now to Rabbi Tamar, remember she's always trying to connect the Mishnah and the teaching with Eretz Yisrael. Go ahead. To plumb the depths of this Mishnah, readers would do well to begin with some words from Theodore Herzl, the father of modern Zionism, who wrote in his introduction to the Jewish state, no human being is wealthy or powerful enough to transplant a nation from one habitation to another. An idea alone can achieve this, and this idea of a state may have the requisite power to do so. The Jews have dreamt this kingly dream all through the long nights of their history. Next year in Jerusalem is an old phrase. It is now a question of showing that the dream can be converted into a living reality. Okay, so pause for a second. Like, there's really nothing to say other than it's interesting that somehow she's connecting Theodore Herzl, right, and his grand work, The Jewish State, with this Mishnah, which teaches that three things sustain the world, justice, truth, and peace. Dean, Emmet, and Shalom. Okay, we'll see where she's going, right? Um, do you see the connection yet? Okay, we'll get there. Okay. Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamel, Gamel has the privilege of concluding the first chapter of our tractate. 
The chapter began with a reference to Moses's role in transmitting Jewish tradition, and then continued with the primary lessons imparted by the sages of each generation to the next, all of whom limited the Torah's power in order to direct its message into the daily life of actual people and to maintain it there. Now, at the end of the chapter, chapter Shimon ben Gamiel returns to the structure that Shimon the righteous set out earlier concerning the three pillars of the world. The formulation here, however, is different from above. Shimon ben Gamel maintains that the world endures because of justice, truth, and peace. The Torah is not mentioned here at all. Perhaps that is because the three things that Shimon ben Gamel does identify as the pillars of the world are all aspects of the Torah in some way, as expressed in the following text. Rabbi Muna said, these three things are really one. If justice is accomplished, truth is accomplished, and peace is thereby affected. And all of them are mentioned in one verse. You shall administer truth and just judgment and peace in your gates. This teaches us that wherever there is justice, there is peace, and wherever there is peace, there is justice. In other words, this one biblical verse comprises all three essential principles on which the world rests. Okay, we'll pause here for a second. What do you think? I know we're sort of stopping mid-thought and mid mid paragraph on her. Yeah, Bob. Um world peace. And that has never happened. Has not happened at all. Yeah. Has not happened at all. What do you think about this idea that the that like all these things are are aspects of Torah. It's all justice, truth, and peace equals Torah, or is encapsulated in Torah. That's, I think, what she's saying. Right? I I think you can have um, justice, peace. Oh, what's the third one? Truth, truth, justice, and peace without having Torah, but. But you can't have Torah, you can't follow Torah without having just uh, truth, justice, and peace. Mm -hmm. Right, and that, that's what I was sort of saying before, is like, uh, which, one, which one is necessary? And that, the rabbis actually, I remember I was teaching a class, and um, there's a question, is, is one of those innate in the, in the creation of the world? Right. Did we need Torah in order to know? I think it was actually a class about truth. Do we need Torah in order to learn truth? Or did God make truth? And then, to, you know, does Torah come from truth? It's like a circular argument. So I don't know if we're going to get an answer. Well, but one, just one, to one, one argument is that, is that the world was created using Torah. So Torah came before truth, justice, and peace. Yeah. Which I think is sort of like this, yeah. Does Torah value truth as a choice? Mm. That's a good question. Mm. I think so. All right, you ready to finish off her uh, comments on this chat? I'll show you where, Rabban Shimon right here. Rabbi Shimon Mengel who saw the world in flames and masses of people killed, tells us that the world endures because of the power of ideas planted in the Torah and actualized by human beings. The Torah is an eternal repository of supreme ideas impervious to the collapse of any given society. And so even in the shadow of the horrors endured by the generation that witnessed the destruction of the temple, there was someone who emphasized that as long as the Torah and its ideas are studied on earth, the Jewish human being will continue to exist. Stop here. I found this really beautiful, yeah. right? What you may not have realized that this rabbi, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, lived at the time of the destruction of the second temple, lived at the time when Israel was being conquered by the Romans, lived at the time when it was unclear if Judaism would survive. Right. So we have to put in the framework of where and when this rabbi was 
and now try to understand the teaching. So what do you get from that? I love that last thought that as long as you're studying Torah, you will have a Jewish people. Yeah. The Torah has always been at once a goal and a salvation. Yeah. And hopefully there will be justice, truth, and peace will emanate from that, right? So now this is where Rabbi Tamar is going to do her shift to from 2,000 years ago, Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel, to this jump to Herzl. So uh, Marvin, we're going to pick you up. There's one place. There is, there is one place, a place of dreams and ideas about which the Jewish people has throughout the generations whispered and for which they have wished. It is the place in which all three of these elements will one day reside together. That place is Jerusalem, which is at the once that which is at once the city of law and righteousness. As it is said, I will restore your magistrates as of old and your counselors as of your. After that, you Get there. Shall, be shall, called. shall be called city of righteousness, faithful city, and the city of truth. As it is said, Jerusalem will be called the city of truth and met and the city of peace. As it is said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love, love you be tran tranquil. May there be peace, shalom within your ramparts, tranquil tranquility in your citadels. We may therefore see the entire first verse of a vote as moving toward this ideal image, ideal image of Jerusalem, which serves as its fitting conclusion. The heavenly Jerusalem for which peace, Jewish people everywhere pray daily, and the earthly Jerusalem to be realized through the endless labor and faith, truth, and peace. As is, as is the case with the Torah itself, there is no, there, yeah, right there. there is, uh, you see my cursor? Oh, uh, yeah, as is the case with the Torah itself, there is no, no point to all those hopes if they are never transformed into reality, just as there is no point to a reality devoid of the dreams that sustain its movement forward. I'm going to pause you here for a second, right? So she has shifted from the destruction of the temple, right? And what it means and what Torah means and the, and the existence and the survival of the Jewish people to a place, right? Jerusalem, an eternal place. And what does Jerusalem stand for? I'm glad you asked. Because I, I was just messing around with the Hebrew. And of course, I don't know Hebrew well enough, Ruth, you're going to scream at me. But I'm, I'm going to say that Yerushalayim is, it comes from Yishar going straight and Shalom, peace. Ir Shalom. Well, that too. But yeah. That, yeah, but, but it could also be that. Yeah. And Ruth can, of course, help. And every, anybody else can, any other Hebrew helper can help too. Yeah. Right. So to take that, I mean, it's, and what's what Rabbi Tamar writes is that Jerusalem exemplifies, personifies, highlights, you know, the ideal Jerusalem is this integration of justice, truth, and peace. By the way, played out through the first three, through Torah, through Avodah, worship, and kindness, acts of kindness, right? And there's the distinction between the Jerusalem that can be, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the Jerusalem that is, the earthly Jerusalem. Any other comments, thoughts? Is it also saying we, we don't, we, while we're not achieving perfection, we're always working toward it? Yes, and that's what she's saying, this entire chapter, right? Which is the, the, the chapter of Perkeva culminates this way, if you remember, like we, we got actually nitty gritty. If you remember, we talked about how you should approach scholars, teachers. We talked about how you should like people, remember, like your neighbors, 
right? You should judge them favorably, who you should stay away from. Do you remember like there were people you should avoid in life? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Then we got to how to be like lawyers, like how to talk, you know, how you testify, how you judge people, right? We like, and we skipped some others in the middle, where to build a fence, where not to, like we, we got to real, what I would call talkless, like real life stuff, right? But she's, what she's saying here, what Rabbi Tamar is saying, right? Like, how do we get to that ideal place, right? This chapter is really going like, how do we live in this world, the real, the reality of this world, and try to get to that ideal? It's very interesting that the Dalai Lama was asking the same questions. How did the Jewish people continue to survive even during the diaspora? where they didn't have a physical home yeah. for the Jewish people, yeah. but they maintained the spiritual home. And there yeah. was always the goal of being to, toward Jerusalem. Yeah, and there's a, very, a couple of lines down, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna read the rest of this paragraph, but there's this one sentence which says, Jerusalem, like the Torah, is an idea that seeks its own realization. Jerusalem seeks its own realization, right? So somehow she's even suggesting here that Jerusalem itself, like the city, strives for justice, peace, and truth, right? Which is a, a really interesting idea and a beautiful idea. Like a, a city has its own aspirations. Um, obviously, it's because of the people in it. It's not the city itself. Um, okay. And now we're going to get to this question, which we thought was like, uh, not uh, like, a, okay. Like, why is there a verse from the Bible that ends this chapter when there really haven't been any verses? So we're going to get Rabbi Tamar's take on it. Marvin, if you read the first chapter. The first chapter of Avot therefore ends with a verse from the prophet Zechariah that encourages all who study the tractate, the, the tractate to attune themselves to the idea that spans the space between the Torah and the entire world. Ideas in the Torah do not engage only the Jewish people, they seek the welfare of the whole human community. Their aim is not to blur the lines between nations or between faith communities, but to express the basic human longing for holiness and life, as the prophet himself wrote. Right. This is, by the way, this is not, this is like two verses after the verse that's quoted. Yeah. Thus okay. said Adonai of hosts, peoples and the inhabitants of many cities shall yet come. Indeed, the inhabitants of one shall go to the other and say, let us go and entreat the favor of Adonai. Let us seek Adonai of hosts. I will go too. The many peoples and the multitude of nations shall come to seek Adonai of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of Adonai. Okay, what, what, are these ver what do you get from these two? Hmm. There are actually three verses. What do these three verses say that she's bringing? which is later in the chapters, like a couple of verses after the verse that was quoted about acquiring that we should seek to administer truth, justice, and peace. Presumably it's the way to, to fulfill the destiny and, and the goal of the right. Torah. This is the idea that all the world's going to gather in Jerusalem mm -hmm. in truth, justice, and peace, right? That Jerusalem is going to be the center focal point of the world of coming together in truth, justice, and peace, right? And this is like what we say. We say this in the Elenu, basically. That's what the Elenu prayer is. Yeah. Okay, so uh, any other comments before we move to her closing and where we get Herzl from? And she brought in Herzl, she's going to close with Herzl. All right, Marvin. From the prophecy of Zechariah, we move on to the words of a prophet of modern times who called to the Jewish people to gather and to return to Jerusalem, only to embark from there on a long new journey. That path awaits the people's dreamers, all of whom... All, all those for whom the power of ideas has not receded and from whom the power to bring those dreams to fruition will never depart. And so we conclude this first chapter of Vote with a different passage from Herzl taken from his visionary novel, Old New Land. 
Okay. We didn't read the quote yet, but do you see what she's doing? Or should we read the quote? All right. Old New Land is Altenoy Land. Yeah. Again, the other classic work that he wrote. Uh, number one, it's interesting to note, right? She is saying there's two prophets, right? There's Zechariah, the biblical prophet Zechariah, and there's the modern day prophet who is Herzl, right? And both of them are saying the ideal in this world, right? Of truth, justice, and peace is in when what happens? It's the, it's the same. Can. When people gather and return to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of peace, right? Where the highest ideals can be met and people can be together. Right. I, I and, thought Herzl didn't care whether it was in, whether the land was in Israel or not. Well, that was a practic. He was pragmatic. He saw the writing on the wall of the rise of you know anti-Semitism and pogroms. But yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, Ruth, did you want to say something? No, so I'm. My question is: Is the Hebrew translation of Alt Neuland? Whatever is on the left, on the right side, the Hebrew. Oh, yes. Is, that's okay. the Hebrew, and then all she's right. going to translate it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I can send it to you if you want. Yeah. Do you, do you want to see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll try to remember to email it to you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. But we'll, we'll read the translation. And okay. you're right, Ron. Uh, this is it. This is the quote. So Marvin, we'll have you read this one. Starting with Jerusalem. Yeah. Jerusalem had been a gloomy, dilapidated city. Now she was risen in splendor, youthful, alert, risen from death to life. It came directly from Jericho up to the top of the Mount of Olives with its wide views. Jerusalem and her, hill, and her hills were still sacred to all mankind, still bore the tokens of reverence bestowed upon her through the ages. But something had been added, new, vigorous, joyous life. The old city within the walls, as far as they could see from the mountaintop, had altered least. The holy sepul sepul sepulcher, sepulcher, sepulcher. The, the mosque of Omar and other domes and towers had remained the same, but many splendid new structures had been, had been added. The magnificent new edifice was the Peace Palace, a vast calm brooded over the old city. Outside the walls, the picture was altogether different. Modern sections intersected by electric street railways, wide tree bordered streets, homes, gardens, boulevards, parks, schools, hospitals, government building, pleasure resorts. Jerusalem was now a 20th century metropolis. Fascinating indeed, but the old city drew their eyes back ever and again. The streets, which at noon had been alive with traffic, were now suddenly stilled. Very few motor cars were to be seen. All the shops were closed. Slowly and peacefully, the Sabbath fell upon the bustling city. Okay, right. that's the ideal Jerusalem. By the way, do you know what language Herzl wrote Altenoy Land in? German, probably. He wrote it in German, published in 1902. Yes. And uh, the Hebrew, which is here, was translated by Nachum Sakalo. And uh, it was given a different name, not called Oitanoi Land. Uh, you can see the note right here. Um, not called Old New Land, right, which is the English translation, but it was called Tel Aviv Sipor. Oh. Uh, well, uh, I'll trust Rabbi Tamar on that, right? Um, and, uh, right, what we're using is the English translation, right? which was translated by David Simon Blondheim in 1916. Um, so thank you for reading that. Any other comments or thoughts before we shift from here? But it's, a, you know, again, taking from Rabbi Tamar, it's a beautiful way to end this first chapter of Perkei Avot. Where did the chapter begin? If we were going to have a location, do you remember where Perkei Avot begins? Sinai. Mount Sinai, exactly. Perkeva begins at Mount Sinai. And yeah. where does it end according to this? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Again, that's not 
in the text itself, right? But that is the idea. Actually, it sort of is, right? That's why she's bringing this quote from Zechariah, Zechariah, because that quote, we thought it was just a quote about truth, justice, and peace, right? An idealism, idealism, idealism that we're supposed to try to work, and that's like the ideal qualities that sustain our world. But she's saying it's more. It's also about location. Right, that location is important, that geography is important, the place where we are is important, the place where we strive for is important. We don't just say Lashon Ababi or Shalayim next year in Jerusalem, but right, we are literally supposed to take the values of Yerushalayim. And those are the values we're supposed to strive to do. And that's well, this is also uh, refuting the claims of others who claim that the Jews were never there. You know, that that's true too, but yeah. yeah here, we're true. trying to claim our homeland, yeah. trying to reclaim what was ours. Yes. And then there are people who deny that claim. Yes. Okay, we're going to shift to chapter two, if that's okay. Can we go to chapter two? Sure. Okay. Uh, all right. We, we should be at about four by now, shouldn't we? Uh, we should be all. We should be a lot further. Well, I mean, we just spent more than half an half an hour on that one teaching. Yeah. All right. So what I wanted I, to look. I, at you know what? I I have done pure K. I vote from one end to the other. I think it took us two years. Yeah, I believe it. I and mean, we could do a lot more. We're just looking at these two two rabbis commenting. You know, we could do a, a million things on this. And that's why it's so rich and so beautiful. That's why we study it not just every year, but some people still study it every single week. Um, so we're moving to chapter two. I wanted to just take a look at three teachings in chapter Again, there's a whole extensive teachings. I think there are 21 teachings in chapter two or 22. I just wanted to look at three of them. We're not having enough time in the 13 minutes. We're going to start it. I guess we're going to have to restart next week, but we're going to at least start. So if you remember, there are a lot of back and forth teachings. Okay, so we're going to look at um, this teaching. We are, it's 2.13 and 2.14. Let me just uh, pull up the page because I'm um, in my book because it actually is to see who teaches this because it's from the, the previous teacher. Um, this is all Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Okay, so... Uh, Ruth, you want to do a little Hebrew reading for us? Yes. The one on the left. Okay. Amar lahem, tzu uru eizuhi derech tova sheyidbak ba ha'adam. Rabbi Eliezer omer, ayin tova. Rabbi Yehoshua omer, chaver tov. Rabbi Yosei omer, shachen tov. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Haroe et Hanolad. Rabbi El Azar Omer, Lev Tov. Amar Lahem, Roe Ani et Divrei El Azar ben Arach, Shebichlal Dvarav Divrei Chem. Thank you. Beautiful. Actually, we this was taught over the weekend, this past weekend, if you were at Shabbat dinner. Um, it's a beautiful teaching. Thanks for reading it, Ruth, in Hebrew. And I'm going to ask, uh, did Jackie, were you the other person who wanted to read? Yep. Okay, if you all read it in English. He said to them, go out and see which is a good path to which a person should cleave. Rabbi Eliezer said, a good eye. Rabbi Yehoshua said, a good colleague. Rabbi Yossi said, a good neighbor. Rabbi Shimon said, the ability to see what the future will yet bring. Rabbi Elazar said, a good heart. He said to them, I favor the words of Elazar ben Arach over yours, for your words are included in his. Okay, so if you know, right, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai here is sort of tasked with picking his favorite student or which is the ideal student of his. Right? And here it's phrased in this phrase, se'u uru'u, go out and see, right? Ezehi derech tova, 
which is the best path, right? Sheyidbak Baha Adam, that a person should, here the Hebrew is to cleave to, right? That should strive to follow, attach themselves to. Um, uh, so right there, these five different ideas, having a good eye, having a good colleague, having be, or sorry, being a good neighbor, seeing into the future, having a good heart, right? And the answer is, Right, that having a good heart includes all of the above. Right? It's a beautiful teaching. Then we get the opposite. Remember, these are oftentimes we get the opposite. So, uh, Ruth, we're going to have you read the facing one, 14. Okay. Amar lahem, tsu uu eizoi derech raa, she yitrachek mimena adam. Rabbi Eliezer omer, ain raa. Rabbi Yehoshua Omer, Chaver Ra. Rabbi Yosei Omer, Shachen Ra. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Halove Veino Meshalem. Echad Halove Min Haadam, Kelove Min Hamakom Baruchu Shenemar. Love Rasha Velo Yeshalem. Betzadik Honem Venoten, which is Tehilim Lamed Vav Bet Alef, Kaf Alef, Rabbi Elaza Omer Levra, Amar Rim, Roe Ani et Divrei Elazar Ben Arach, Shebichlal Dvarav Divrei Chem. Okay, so we're going to read the English. Yeah, go ahead. Rabbi, it, uh, when we say Birkot Ashachar, there is something Yehi Ratzon Mifanecha Adonai Elohim Elohotai Shetatzileni Hayom Bechol Yom Me'azei Panim Azut Panim Me'adam Ra Me'chavir Ra U'mishachen Ra Mipeg Ra U'misatan HaMashchit So yeah. is it built on that? Probably, yes. That's filot or later. Yes, the yeah, prayer yes, was yeah. written with this yes. in mind. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Exactly. If you didn't catch it, well, let's read, let's read the translation first, and then we'll talk about that. Okay, go ahead, Jackie. He said to them further, go out and see which is an evil path from which one should distance oneself. Rabbi Eliezer said, an evil eye. Rabbi Yehoshua said, an evil colleague. Rabbi Yossi said, an evil neighbor. Rabbi Shimon said, borrowing money and failing to repay it, for borrowing from other people is the same as borrowing from the blessed omnipresent. As it is said, a wicked person borrows but fails to repay, whereas a righteous person is generous and gives back the funds owed. Rabbi Elazar said, an evil heart. He said to them, I favor the words of Elazar ben Arach over yours, for your words are included in his. Okay, so pretty much a parallel, right? Mm -hmm. What's not a parallel? <laughs> the borrowing money. Yeah, the borrowing money is that one sort of outlier in this, right? Whereas, yeah. right, once have the ability to see what the future will yet bring, I don't know, maybe there is actually a connection between it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think borrowing money, the issue is, it doesn't say don't borrow money. What does it say? Don't you have to give it back. Right, mm -hmm. right. It says that you have to be able to ensure that you can pay it back, right? Mm -hmm. Right, so it doesn't say don't borrow money. And maybe that has something to do with the future, right? Because that rabbi talked about being able to see what the future will bring. Um, so, right, that's something interesting to talk about. Um, right, but obviously, pretty much the word tov is replaced with ra, ra. right? Good eye, evil eye, right? Good colleague, bad colleague, or evil colleague. Good neighbor, evil neighbor. Good heart, and then the question is, what is a lev ra, an evil heart or a wicked heart, right? And as Ruth said, in Bikarashachar, if you have a Sidor, it's on page six in our weekday prayer book, if you want to pull it off if you have it nearby. As Ruth said, we all, we begin with our 11, Bikarashachar, 11 morning blessings, the, that those, you know, one-offs, you know, thank you, God, for making, you know, making me a Jew. Thank you, God, for making me free. Thank you, God, for 
you know, giving strength to the weary. Thank you, God, for crowning me, right? And then right after that, there's this prayer, right? Please, God, remove slumber from my eyelids. May you feel home in Torah. Keep me from any error or sin. Bring us not to disgrace. And here's the quote. Keep us far from wicked people and corrupt companions. Strengthen our desire to do good deeds. Teach us humility that we may serve you. And there actually is a quote from this within that. So yes, the rabbis took that and put it in. Anything else sort of stick out or or uh, before we, I don't think we have time. We're, uh, next time we're gonna delve deep into it. We don't have time to do a deep dive yet. Any other sort of opening missives? Other than obviously these are a couplet. You know, these are matching teachings. One's obviously the positive and one's the negative. This has nothing to do with the positive and the negative in, in these specifically, but the numbering in the book I'm using is totally different. I'm on like two nine. Yeah, they yeah. Every every perky vote is numbered differently. Um just a couple of thoughts. One is, um, again, Perkei Avot, ethical teachings, is there like a ton of Jewish Torah here? Like, like who's, if, I, if we're going to ask, like, who's your best student? Basically, they're saying, who's your best student? Rabbi Yochanan ben, ben Zakai, right? If I would ask who's your best student, what might be the measuring stick? I mean, asking questions, asking questions, learning, right? Like, I mean, there are other factors here, right? It's interesting to note that the characteristics, the personal qualities that Rabbi Yochanan, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai is highlighting has nothing specifically to do with being Jewish, right? Nothing specifically having to do with study. Nothing specifically having to do with Torah, right? These are mensch lichkeit qualities, correct? Which perhaps you might expect or might not expect. I don't know, right? What do you think? I'll give you the quote from Rabbi Tucker in the commentary, so you don't have, we don't have to read it all. Um, Rabbi Yochanan Zakai is asking his students to consider their experiences of the world and to state a conclusion regarding what character trait should cultivate all the others. It's noteworthy that experiencing life rather, rather than consulting tradition is recommended, and the answers given are not at all specific to the Jewish milieu. I don't know if I've ever used milieu in a sentence before. Um, any other sort of comments, thoughts? Yeah, Bob? Um, I'm interested in why he asked the question. Ah, so what you don't see is what proceeds. This is a long line, and I'll give it to you again. Whatever numbers uh, Ron has in his Perke but I'll give you what proceeds it. Um, the three Mishnahs ago, um, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai, it just says he had five students and it just names them. Then the next Mishnah after that um, was um, he praises each one for a different thing. You may have heard this one before. Rabbi Eliezer is a cistern that never loses a drop. Rabbi Yoshua is, uh, is the... Is, uh, is happy, Rabbi Yossi is pious, Rabbi Shimon is fear sin, and the other one is a powerfully flowing spring, right? And then like, there are all these things. So this is in a series of five different teachings that outline different things about his students. Um, just for a second, and we're approaching the end, what's special about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai and when he lived?
It seems like he appreciated his uh, students. Okay, good. But even, uh, I'm sorry, I'm asking a deeper question. What do you yeah. know about Rebbe? I'm going to stop the share here so we can just talk for a second and then we'll wrap up. Three three minutes. What do we know about when he lived? What happened to Rebbe Yochanan ben Zakkai? Was the temple still standing? Yeah, do, do anyone know the story of Rebbe Yochanan, Rebbe Yochanan ben Zakkai? As yeah. soon as you start to tell it, I'll say, yep, I right? know. He is the one who negotiated with the Romans. He's yeah. the one who went in the coffin. Remember, they put him in the coffin? Yes. Carried yes. his dead body out so that he could have a moment to talk to the emperor and to negotiate the survival of the Jewish intellectual history. He is the one who had the... Well, the asked the Romans or whatever, negotiated to have Yavne, the academy, Yavne, yes, that the yes. academy would still exist, that that intellectual Judaism, that Jewish tradition would still live on, right? So what we have here, and what, if you remember from chapter one, how many rabbis were the leading rabbis of the generation? Two, if you remember, there were always, there was a pair. Right. There were two rabbis, right? There was the Av Beitin, the head of the court, and then there was the, the Nasi, Nasi. Nasi. The Nasi, the president or the, the other leader, right? What Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai realizes is in order to sustain Judaism, he needed more. Needed more than two to work with him, right? At a time of destruction and focusing on the survival of Judaism, how many did he need? Five. He needed five, right? So he designated these five as the ones to carry on tradition. And here he is, I think, you know, when we can read more commentary and we will next week, right? He's figuring out why these five, what make these five different and significant, and what are the qualities that each of them embody in the preservation of Judaism and the transmission of Judaism when it was potentially a time when Judaism wouldn't even survive. Hmm. So we're going to leave it there. A little bit of a cliffhanger. <laughs> Judaism survives, thank God. Thanks to partially because Rabbi Yochanan Zakai's plan to do that. Yeah. Uh, but, and also, by the way, five is a good number because there are five books of Moses. You know, there's a lot of fives. So five is a, is a strong number in Judaism. Right, and they are the ones that can disseminate the tradition, each in their own way, but carrying their teachers and those who have gone before. But so, there should have been six because there's six orders of the Mishnah. It didn't exist. And, yeah, and they but were doing. But the this Mishnah. is still They're in the creation the of the Mishnah. The Mishnah wasn't. When was the Mishnah composed? But that, this is what they're writing now. So there should have been six of them. The Mishnah wasn't fully composed yet. There's still. This is still early. Rabbi, Rabbi Yossi Hagalili, you know, the or Rabbi Mayer, right? Yeah, this is this is still a hundred more than a hundred years before the Mishnah is finished. Yeah. The, if you don't if you understand that it was not the oral oral Torah given straight from Sinai. Yeah. Yeah, it's still in composition phase. They, it's not been formalized into six orders yet. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you for learning with me. I'll see you next week on time.